Hey everyone and welcome back to the series on hand calculations. In this video we will be discussing the wedge factor. So let's start with a basic definition of the wedge factor and this is the definition here. So it's a function of r which is your field size, it's a function of d which is the depth that you're measuring at or calculating at, it's also a function of x which is the distance off the central axis that you are. And this is going to be equal to this first term w sub theta which is your wedge factor for the given wedge angle along the central axis which is dependent on your field size r and the depth d and this is multiplied by the off axis ratio for that wedge angle uh, which is a function of field size depth and off axis distance and direction. And the central axis wedge factor is something that we can easily measure and that's what the second equation shows here. Uh, so we put the wedge in the beam and we place the detector along the central axis and we deliver a certain number of MU and then we remove the wedge and deliver the same number of MU and we just take the, the ratio of those two dose measurements basically and that'll give us the wedge factor. And we can also measure the off-axis ratio by measuring a beam profile which we'll get into a little bit later. This diagram here just illustrates kind of the concepts I mentioned previously. On the left we have the situation without the wedge and on the right we have the situation with the wedge and so we just take the ratio of the doses measured uh, in these two situations. The diagram also nicely illustrates the directional dependence of the off-axis ratio, right? Like if you went left, um, there would physically be what, less wedge there so your dose would be higher, but if you went right, there's more material there in the wedge so you would be attenuating more uh, and the dose would be lower. So we'll get into that in a little bit too. So now we can go ahead and state some facts about the wedge factor uh, and we can start with the fact that the wedge factor has a known field size and depth dependence. Even though these effects are small, they exist. The field size dependence comes from the fact that different field sizes irradiate a different amount of the wedge and you get differential scatter properties. And the depth dependence comes from the beam hardening effect that you see as the beam passes through the wedge and so you have a harder beam. Um, the wedge factor also depends on the wedge angle. This one's pretty self-explanatory. A steeper wedge angle gives you a steeper um, wedged field, basically. Um, the wedge factor depends on the off-axis distance and direction that you move. Um, I kind of touched on this a little bit previously, uh, but this is only in the wedge direction, right? If you're moving uh, not in the wedge direction, then it's not really going to matter. Um, because there's, there's no slope in that direction. And the last one is that wedge fields can be created with physical wedges or by sliding a draw across the field. So physical wedges are something that you actually place in the beam and you are completely changing the photon spectrum of the beam and the shape of the dose distribution in the phantom or the patient. Uh, but you can also create the same effect by sliding a jaw across the field, but this is actually a little bit more advantageous because it's not a completely different spectrum beam. Uh, you're just actually collimating out portions of the beam uh, and you're adjusting the speed of the jaw as it's sweeping across in order to give a desired wedge angle. This technique has its own limitations in that it's not as versatile as a hard wedge and you're kind of limited in uh, directions that you can make wedges. Um, but it's dosimetrically advantageous because it's easier to characterize and uh, you're not changing the photon spectrum of the beam at all. So here's a nice example of a wedge table, a uh, wedge factor table for a 15 degree wedge. These are all along the central axis. Uh, so you can see your field size uh, increases as you move down and you also have the wedge factors listed at different depths here so you can see uh, generally, as you increase your field size, that wedge factor goes up, and generally, as your depth increases, uh, your wedge factor also goes up as well, uh, at least until you get, you know, really deep down. Um, but these are the general trends, and I mean, the magnitudes here are very similar, um, so these are very small effects, and these aren't effects that you would even consider if you uh, shaped your wedge fields with a jaw sweeping across the field. This is only for hard wedges. And here's another example of a wedge factor table. Uh, this time it's showing 
uh, for all of these different wedge, wedge angles, 15, 30, 45, 60, at all of these different field sizes. And you can see that the wedge factor gets smaller and smaller and smaller as your wedge angle uh, gets bigger. And another thing that you should notice here is that some field sizes don't have wedge factors defined for uh, these larger wedge angles. And that's because at some point you're limited by the weight of your wedge and the bulkiness of the wedge. So with these thicker wedge angles, uh, you really would need a lot of material if you wanted to cover the entire field. And so um, at that point, you're kind of getting a small workout in when you're lifting these wedges and clipping them into the, the treatment head. Um, so they, they're, they actually have limited field sizes because of that. And here are some example wedge profiles. If you recall, when I defined the wedge factor, we split it into two parts, right? We had the central axis wedge factor and the off-axis ratio. And this is where you would come to get the off-axis ratio. You can see the y-axis is the ratio to the central axis value. So depending on whichever distance you move off-axis and direction, uh, you could come here and just multiply your central axis wedge factor by whatever value you find on this plot. Uh, and that would give you the total wedge factor uh, for your calculation point. And you can see there's profiles for different depths here, and you're starting to see some of that depth dependence as well. And here are some pictures of some physical wedges. So on the left, you have a lower wedge, which you just kind of clip into um, the treatment head, and then the one on the right is actually an upper wedge, which you can slide in kind of upstream closer to the x-ray source, and these are just showing two different models of wedges. Uh, you can mount them in different spots. Um, just wanted to share that. Here's some photos of a wedge mounted in four different directions, and there's really two things that I want to illustrate here. The first is you have great versatility with hard wedges, right? There's four different wedge directions that we can use. Uh, so it's very versatile in that manner. Uh, the second is I just want to point out again, the field size constraint you have with this large of a wedge. I mean, it's you really can't go that wide using a wedge this big. So you just need to be conscious of that if you're planning with a hard wedge. And that's going to be about it for this video. So thank you for watching.